The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to be an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, Stooping in and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Well, I hope that you pay attention during the sermon because randomly I'm just going to do that to make sure you're awake. <laughs> All right. So, a happy Easter to every single one of you. Today is a great day of joyous celebration. You know, it's the eighth day of Holy Week. And, well, in order to explain this properly, let me back up one. Seven. The number seven in the Bible is the number of completion. It took God seven days to create the heavens and the earth, right? To create all of creation through the word. And in seven days of Holy Week that we've already had, these past seven days, we have seen how sin completely devastated the good creation God has made. And we completely see how God goes about dealing with that sin. We see how completely it costs God. It costs God everything, even his own son. Why last week, if we go back to the beginning of the seven days that have passed, Palm Sunday, we witnessed Jesus in a parade of palms. People definitely weren't Lutheran. They had their hands in the air and they were waving them around like they just didn't care. They were waving those palms and they were like, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. And they were marching for miles saying Hosanna, while Hosanna, by the way, means save us now. They believed Jesus was that one to save them now. And so they shout Hosanna, they wave the palm branches. And Jesus wasn't coming in like some military Messiah. He was coming in humble on a donkey. And really, when I say donkey, I have to say, in my mind, I always picture it like Shrek. Donkey, you know? Like, he wasn't coming in on a Budweiser Clydesdale. He was coming in on a donkey, right? He's coming in, and it's not what they expected. And so, that was Sunday. Then Monday comes around. And Monday, we get the story of how uh, Jesus went into the temple, which was right where Jesus was going anyway on Palm Sunday. Because there's this gate, it's called the Eastern Gate, which was on the Eastern Wall of Jerusalem. And it's also nicknamed the Golden Gate. And so Jesus goes through that gate, and he goes into the temple, and he sees money changers there. People turning the synagogue, this place of worship, his father's house, into a merchant place, a shop. A place to make money and take advantage of people. And he goes in, and he turns on over to tables in his righteous indignation. So that's Monday of Holy Week. Then Tuesday, Jesus takes some more time to preach. He takes some more time to teach. He uses parables, and I love parables. Parables are stories with a point that point us to God. 
And Jesus was telling parables so that the wise and the simple alike could understand the way and the love of God. On Wednesday, we don't really know what happens because all the Gospels are silent. But they make up for that silence with Thursday and Friday. In this ongoing seven-day week of God completely dealing with sin. On Thursday, we see Jesus give us a new commandment. That's what Monday Thursday means. Monday meaning command. We see him giving us a new command. In fact, a new covenant in his blood. His body and blood given and shed for us. The same thing that we celebrate later on in our worship today. That you are invited to come to. Come to the Lord's table where he invites you, where he invited his disciples. This new covenant as a Passover lamb, and not just the Passover lamb, but the perfect lamb of God, without blemish, without sin. He offered himself for us and for our salvation. So Jesus gives us this new covenant. So just like in the Exodus, when the Jews would put over... A slaughter a lamb and put the blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over them and keep them alive. So Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, sheds his blood so that eternal death would pass over us, our sins forgiven. And Jesus also gave us a new command on that Monday Thursday. As he, in the, the spot, the table where he is at, he is in the most honored position he is at the head of the table and he looks and he gets up and he goes over and ties a towel around his waist and goes to the servant's position where Peter was seated and he begins to wash Peter's feet and Peter says no 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 don't do that don't do that Jesus I'm not worthy of that and he says if I can't if you don't do this then we can't be together. And Peter's like, well, okay, well, in that case, wash all of me. That would be awesome. Great. And Jesus is like, no, your feet's fine. So, um, so he washes his feet and he washes his disciples' feet. And he goes, look, I'm doing this on purpose because I want you to get this lesson through your head. I, I give you a new command. I want you to love one another as I love you. And by this, everyone's going to know that you're my disciple by how you love one another. So then Jesus is like, hey, things are going pretty good. We got new commandment. We're awesome. Things are going well. Then what happens? Judas, seated to Jesus' left. Judas betrays Jesus. And Jesus says, go do what you got to do. And Judas runs out and everyone's like, what just happened? And Jesus is like, one of you will betray me. And everyone's like, is it I? And then Jesus takes the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? This is still on Thursday night. A lot happened then. Thursday night, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes to pray as the Son of God to the Father, Father God. And he says, if this cup can be taken away from me, please take it away. But not my will, but yours be done. And God the Father said, this is my will. It has to be done. And once that was discovered, nothing could stop Jesus from fulfilling the Father's mission. And in fact, that night, Judas comes back, greets Jesus with a kiss, which was just the signal to push forward his betrayal to the police who had clubs and swords who came to arrest this one who preached reconciliation and peace. That was Thursday. Then Friday came. And you know what happened on Friday. There was... A false court. I mean, let's be honest. It actually says in there <laughs> that, uh, what did it say? Yeah, that's right. Jesus was declared innocent, yet he was condemned to flogging and execution by crucifixion as a criminal. That's what happened on Good Friday. Then Saturday, the scriptures are as silent as the grave. Because that was supposed to be the final chapter of the life and ministry of Jesus. But then, ha oh, oh, ha oh, ha oh, then the eighth day came. Today, the Sunday following Palm Sunday, the Sunday following Monday Thursday, the Sunday following Good Friday, the Sunday, 
the eighth day of Holy Week. And you know what happened on the eighth day? Well, let me tell you. The eighth day is a really important thing in the Bible. The number eight is very important because, well, I have to tell you this. Boys, when they're born, on the eighth day, they were circumcised and named. Sorry, guys. And then, according to Romans 2 and Colossians 2, the number 8 symbolizes the circumcision of all of our hearts by the receiving of the Holy Spirit, receiving the gospel message that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. So, personally, I think the Beatles owe God some royalty rights. Personally, because they sing, I ain't got nothing but love, babe. Yes, and the choir, you kicked in this time. That was good. Last time, every, the, the, the first service crowd went, eight days a week. <laughs> and it was pathetic. You totally killed that. That was awesome. Okay, that's right. The number eight represents new life, a new beginning, a new order of creation. The first order is gone. We ruined it with sin. Jesus is doing something new on Easter, something new today. The dead Jesus is now our risen Savior with Easter morning, and on the eighth day, new life dawns. So today, my friends, good news. God offers you new life by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's awesome news. And it's easy to see today. I mean, Julie and her volunteers did a great job decorating the church today. The choir sounds amazing. The bell choir? Choir! Right there. <laughs> Did an amazing job with their stuff today. But let me tell you, it's easy to see the joy of Jesus on this Easter. At least I hope it is. And it may even be easy to see it tomorrow. But as we go from this day, the joy may get a little hazy. It may get a little out of focus. Kind of like, um, well, let me compare it this way. Has anyone ever moved into a new place, a new dorm room, a new apartment, a new house? You know that when you move into a place, you're like, okay, this is where my notebook goes. This is where my keys go. This is where my cell phone goes, right? You know that. You, there is a place for everything and everything in its place. That's right, okay. The idea is that everything should have a place for it to go. Now, how many of you have lost your keys sometime this past week? How about trying, anybody tried to find their phone this week? Does this happen in your house? Babe, call my phone. Call my phone. Hey, can you call my phone? Oh, it was on vibrate. It was in my purse. Never mind. Don't look at Marcy. Look at me. Okay. <laughs> Has anybody else lost their phone this weekend and someone else call it? Don't lie. You're in church. Okay. So, sometimes it can be difficult to remember those things that are important. Where did I leave my faith? Where did I leave my joy? Where can I find it when I lose it? I imagine for the women who stayed by Jesus' cross at the crucifixion and saw their Lord, their master, their rabbi, their friend, beaten and dying and hanging there by nails. It was, it was tough to see. It was hazy to see what God was going to do with this. And you know his funeral, Jesus' funeral, happened that same day. Many of you know that I just got back from the Holy Land. I was there just a few weeks ago. And while we were literally at the Church of the Nativity, literally at the place where Jesus was born, the place where we really believe he was born, as we were exiting that church of worship, the newborn king, there was a funeral procession that came into the church. A lady had passed away, and she had passed away that very morning. And it was only early afternoon. And our tour guide, Johnny, told us, he said, this is the way it is in the Middle East. Somebody could pass away in the morning hours and their funeral be held in the afternoon. 
That's exactly the way it was for Jesus. Jesus was hung on a cross at noon. He died at 3 p.m. Joseph of Arimathea got permission to take Jesus' body off the cross. The ladies then anointed his body and cleaned it up and had his funeral. That's what happened. And that's the way it was, and that's the way it's still done in Israel today. So the women observed the Sabbath Saturday, and on Sunday morning they came not with the parade of hosannas, not with people wailing and lamenting Jesus' death, just a small group of women who came to anoint Jesus' body with the spices they had prepared. It was a small thing, but you know, there are many of us who are willing to do great things for the Lord, but far fewer who are willing to do the small things. They were willing. And when they got there, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they went in, they didn't find the body. Now here I'm going to tell you something that's not in the Gospel of Luke, but is found in Mark and Matthew. And that is, there's another custom in Israel, in the Holy Land. And that is, have you ever heard of throwing in the towel? Sure you have. That's when you know, boxers, MMA fighters... UFC, whatever, they'll throw in the towel, they surrender, they quit. In the Middle East, when someone is at the dinner table, maybe you'll have Easter lunch right after this, they would take their napkin, and the napkin was a very important thing, because if you wadded it up and you threw it in your chair or on the table, that meant you were done. That's it, you can clean up my food, take it away, we're done. But, if it was folded, and neatly placed on the chair or on the table, it meant, don't you dare take my food away because I'm coming back. And when the women and Peter and the disciples, depending on which gospel account you read, when they came into the tomb, they found the shroud of Jesus' face. They found the, the, the linen that had covered his body folded up and neatly placed. He came back. That's what happened on Easter Sunday. They got there and they're perplexed what they were seeing. And suddenly these two men showed up before them and they bowed down in fear. And the men said, why do you look for the living among the dead? Don't you remember? He said he was going to rise again. Friends, that's a really good question. Not just for the ladies back then, but for us today. How many of us are looking for life? In all the wrong places. How many of us are looking for something to bring us life amongst the things that are dead? I mean, the angels ask that question, and we do that a lot. We look for life on our cell phones, an inanimate object. We look for life at the bottom of your choice of bottle. We look for life and things like success and fame and acclaim and money and sports, all those things which may be great one second and gone the next. And you may find happiness there. But those things generally stop there. Maybe you don't give it conscious thought. Maybe you just keep going and if you don't pay attention and you don't give yourself time to feel, maybe you won't ever have to deal with it. Maybe your spirit animal is an ostrich. Maybe you listen to too much Pink Floyd that tells you to be comfortably numb. Then one day passes by, you, you catch yourself, and you wonder where your life went. Today, this Easter day, God has good news for you. Don't look for the living among the dead. Christ is risen. He is risen. And that's where we're going to find life. Keep saying it. The next time someone cuts you off, say, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Okay. You know? And, it, <laughs> okay. and Jesus lives. Jesus lives. And when we start with that, 
When we start with that, we don't have to put our faith and our trust. We don't have to look at things that are dead in order to find life because we have a risen Lord who is very much alive. In fact, I will tell you, there are more historical witnesses to Jesus rising from the dead. There are those who interviewed eyewitnesses of the resurrection of the Christ. The four gospels detail the event, the writings of Jesus, about Jesus rising up. In fact, Paul talks about there are 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And if that weren't enough, there is a historian, a renowned Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus, who lived in the same century as Jesus, and he confirms as an outside source the resurrection of Jesus as he writes, for he appeared to them on the third day, living again as the divine prophets foretold, along a myriad of other marvelous things concerning him. And hear this, because it's true. There is actually more reliable historical evidence to Jesus' life and resurrection than there is to the life and death of Julius Caesar. This is true. So we don't look for life amongst the dead. We look for life with our living Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Jesus gives us the hope we're looking for. Jesus gives us the life we're looking for. Jesus gives us the love we're looking for. Today, Jesus reminds us that no matter of what chapter in life we are in, this is not the end of our story. Instead, it is only the beginning. God has accomplished something so spectacularly true, as God usually does, as God always does, creating life from dry bones, buds from barren trees, sprouts from dead seeds, resurrection life from a tortured and weary body, because that's who God is. God has the authority, God has the power, God has the grace and love because God is a life giver. And today, I pray that you believe in Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again. Believe and accept the new life Christ offers to you fully and freely. Drop your grudge for your family, for we develop and maintain the capacity to forgive when we believe in Jesus. Someone who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power of love. There is some good in the worst of us and there is some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. So stop hating and start loving because love is the only thing that can transform an enemy to a friend. If you feel like you're just wandering through this life with no real sense of direction, I get it, I've been there. I started out a music major and they asked me to stop. <laughs> And then I was an elementary ed major. And then God's like, ha, 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 be a pastor. <laughs> but I wanted to make so much money as a school teacher. <laughs> anyway. Was that too much? Too far? Okay, all right. So I'll just go back to teaching about Jesus. Okay. Um, sometimes we don't know where to go in this life. And then Jesus says, hi, remember me? The way, the truth, and the life? Maybe if we start reading God's word, God's word will reveal itself to us as exactly what it says it is, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And when the power of God's life, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, lives in you, when God's love and life sparks that fire in your heart, maybe for the first time, or maybe it's a reignition. We know what we're supposed to do. We say it at every baptism. So let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. My friends, rejoice. Rejoice, people of God. Don't look for the living among the dead. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. May the life of Jesus Christ raise you to new life. Yes, at the second coming, but every day. Until that day. Amen and amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. To help us meditate on this good news of the gospel message, our choir has a musical offering for us, which we hope you'll enjoy.